But note right off the bat that the aggressor, the physical uh, intimacy aggressor in this relationship is not the lover, it's the babe. And she's thinking about her man, she's like, oh, I need some lip now. <laughs> now, just so you know, I think it's a great thing for couples to kiss each other in front of their kids. Not like inappropriately weird. <laughs> but there's, there's nothing I like more than to come into my kitchen, see my wife there, dip her, and just lay a big, fat, sloppy one right on her in front of my kids. What do they do? Oh! Gross! Get her room! Ah! Right? But it's one of the greatest gifts that we give our kids. Here's why. <laughs> they know that I love this woman. I am hot for mama. <laughs> and it, it provides them a security in the home. Physical touch is a good thing for kids to see. It not only provides a security for them as they're growing up, it lets them know how they should act once they get one of these, a spouse, that is. Are you with me? So don't be, you know, don't be all like, I want to kiss, but let's go, you know, outside. What is that? You want to kiss your wife, fellas? In fact, go ahead. If you're married here right now, turn to your wife, give her a good one. Give, go ahead. Some of you are like, this is a weird church. All right. All right, settle down. Some of you are kind of getting weird. And some of you are kissing, you know, make sure it's your, okay. Anyway, uh. <laughs> that's the first phrase. All right, um. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. He's talk she's talking about her, her husband, and she says, oh, man, your love is so great. It's better than a, a good bottle of wine in the way that that would make me feel. Now, not, this is not us saying that we condone, you know, the abuse of alcohol or anything like that. But uh, what she's saying is, man, I am drunk with your love. Remember feeling that way? Some of you have been married for a long time. You're like, wow, I don't remember ever feeling that way. That's weird. <laughs> But just so you know, if you're on this side of marriage, there should be. There should be that, you know, Cupid, I don't believe in Cupid, but there should be that like, oh. And that feeling, that pitter-patter in your heart, that like, mm, you know, when he walks in the room, girls, or, hey, there she is. Why am I walking this way? You know, this is, there should be that tractor beam kind of attraction, even after you've been married for a while, just so you know. She says, man. Uh, his, he, pleasing is the fragrance of your perfume. He, he's talking about, she's not talking about his cologne here. Uh, he, she goes on and she says, your name is like perfume poured out. You know what she's saying? She, she's, whenever you talk biblically about someone's name, a name is a huge thing in the Bible. It's an identifier. It has meaning. We, we just throw names on people. Some of us might know what our names actually mean, but most of us don't. We're just, I'm Mark, you're Bill, Sue, whatever. But back then, you got a name and it meant something. Because your name encased for you your character and how you were depicted in culture. And she says, your name, it's like a perfume. You know what this lady's saying to her husband? She's saying, you know what? I am so proud of you and I am so honored to be married to you. Because, and this is what the Hebrew means, you're a stud. You are a beef cake. I mean, you are a man of men. You are the guy. In fact, look at the next line. She says, no wonder the maidens love you. No wonder every girl in town is like jealous of me. Because you're such a hoss. I mean, you are, and she's not talking about his physical appearance. She's not, she says your name. She says, you by reputation are so desirable. Your character is so noble. You are so uh, head and shoulders above other men. And I am so honored to be your wife. I want to kiss you. I mean, you make me drunk. I love you so much. Sounds like a pretty good uh, gig, huh? This, this sound good to anybody? It's got a little spark to it, doesn't it? She goes on, she says, Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. And that's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> it's business time, right? I mean, it is, I mean, it, 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 that's what's happened. She's talked herself into a froth, and she's like, we got to get out of here. And you know why. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the friends say, we rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than once. They're agreeing. They're saying, hey, uh, uh, woman, you, you have. You have scored the jackpot. This guy, 
And, and we are so happy for you to be in this amazing relationship. And she says, how right they are, her friends are, to adore you. Yeah, that sound, man, that sounds good to me. Who's in? Who wants that? That sound good? It, it, it's, it's interesting to, to note that, that this description of this couple uh, corresponds with what is written about a thousand years later by a guy named Paul in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5 where he says that the man is to love the woman as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for her, that, that the woman is to respect the man or submit to the man. Now, I don't have time to preach this all right here, but, but just know that those are the two greatest needs of each of the spouses. The man, he, he needs to, to know that the woman respects him, that she, she reveres his character, that she trusts him, that, that, that he provides her you know, with the security that she needs. That's when, when a guy uh, is, is being badgered and nagged and always criticized by his woman, he just goes in a hole and, and shrinks up and, and removes himself emotionally from the marriage. Well, when he does that, you know what he does? He takes away from the woman her greatest need. Her greatest need is to feel loved, cared for, nurtured. And, and ladies, uh, just so you know, fellas, uh, you're, you're all going to you know, uh, look different from your wedding pictures, those of you who are not there yet. I, I, I can show you mine. I should, actually, but I'm too embarrassed. I'm just a different man. And so she's not, she's not so much worried about the, you know, the slope of your shoulders as much as she is about the security that you can give her. She wants to know that she's number one in your universe and that you'll do, that, that's what love is. She'll, you'll die to yourself for her sake. Uh, to, to me, as we read this first part of Song of Solomons, or Song of Songs, it looks like that's what's happening. I mean, she is... She is lauding him for his character. And look what it's doing to her, fellas. You want to get your woman revved up? Be a man of character. Be a man that she can respect, a man that she can trust. That, that's the greatest aphrodisiac ever made. Now, these two are hitting on all cylinders. But it wasn't easy. Now, we're going to see the rest of the story unfold. It wasn't once upon a time and happily ever after. They had to work at it. But let's go all the way back. We're going to kind of go back in a time shift here. It's kind of the Wayne's world. All right, they're going to go all the way back. And they're going to, they're going to go back to when they first met. And this, this woman is going to tell her friends that story. Look what happens in verse 5. It says this. Dark am I, yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. She says, girls, you should have seen me back then. Uh, and, and some of you are thinking, oh, yeah, that's a good thing. She's tan. But she says, dark like the tents of Kedar like the tent curtains of Solomon. And then she goes on and she says this, do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. And we're like, what? Because in our culture, having a tan's a good thing. I mean, we all try to get one. We've actually built, you know, booths that you could go and lay in and artificially, you know, make that happen. Why? Because tan is beautiful, for the most part, in the age that we live in. But in the age that this is written in, Tan's not beautiful. In fact, tan, back then, was ugly. Tan goes beyond just being ugly. Tan was a sign of social status. Like, ladies, if you had a tan back then, that meant that you were outside of a woman's realm. A woman's realm, back in those days, was meant to be in the home, uh, you know, in the kitchen, doing the home. And I know you're like, oh, gross, oh, that's, but that's how it was back then. And so if, if ladies, you went outside in the, in the desert heat of Israel and you were out, you know, working in the fields or working in the, in the, in the flocks, uh, as this woman was, and you got tanned, it was a, a social stigma. You would be seen as someone who was lesser than all the other girls who got to stay inside. Are you with me? And so this is the first girl ever, the only time ever in existence that a woman has ever been uh, concerned about her appearance. It's the only time recorded in all of history. Are you picking up my sarcasm as I throw it? No. In this, I mean, guy, those of us who have been, or are in a dating relationship or in a marriage relationship, isn't it uncanny how a wife can take one of your compliments and, and, and just completely negate it? Babe, you look great tonight. Oh, no, I don't. I'm fat in these pants, and look at the, my makeup's running, and, and you know, uh, I'm a cow. I just can't believe this. You know, ladies, I don't know why you do that. It doesn't encourage us to do what we're, you know, it doesn't help us with our comp but, but we do. And ladies, it's, here's the deal. For the most part, generally speaking, ladies are just way more self-conscious than men. You know? Uh, agreed? Am I, am I off with this? Have we all grown up in the world? We, we're all like, this is, we're not new to the planet. Okay. So, uh, so, so here's what you're seeing. 
This woman meets Solomon the first time, and she's having a bad hair day. I mean, she doesn't feel attractive. She's self-conscious. I mean, if, you know, some of you ladies, uh, especially if you're trying to attract a mate, I mean, you spend hours, you know, uh, preparing the lore. You know, you, it's like you're tying a, a, fly, a fly, fish fly. You know, you're out there just trying to get all dolled up so that you can be the most attractive you can. Most women don't, like, crawl out of bed, uh, throw on their sweats, and head to the club 